Welcome back to another video as part of the AP Psychology course. This is lesson number 13, beginning our unit 3, which is on cessation and perception. And so uh, in this introductory video, I'm going to briefly highlight how exactly it is believed we are going to experience sensation and then perception. And so sensation here you can see is a stimulation of sensory organs. This may include your taste buds, your ears, your uh, eyes smelling as well as a touch or tactile sensation. Perception on the other hand is how we're going to actually selectively organize and then interpret the sensory input that we're getting. So what we have here is a, a case of Dr. P and uh, Dr. P refers to this person who in Oliver Sacks work um, which is a novel about person who basically suffers from visual agnosia. Visual agnosia is when you have an inability to recognize objects through sight. So if you get other sensory stimulation, perhaps smell or taste or tactile, then maybe that would help identify it. But sight alone is not going to be able to identify the object. So if you have someone who's holding a rose in front of you and you suffer from visual agnosia, if you just look at it, then of course you'd have no idea that you're looking at a rose. Now if they let you feel it or they describe it to you or they put it up near your nose and you can smell it, then of course you might be able to identify that it's a rose. But uh, in the case of this case study, which Oliver Sacks was looking at, there was a person who literally mistook their wife's head for uh, a hat. And so uh, this guy thought he was seeing uh, a hat that he could grab to put on, and instead it was his wife's head. So he suffered from this condition. Another version of this is called prosopagnosia. And with this one, you actually experience face blindness. So just imagine uh, an inability to recognize pretty common faces, you know, people that are across many cultures pretty known take people like Oprah Winfrey or Tom Cruise Donald Trump currently President Obama these are people that a lot of people would recognize but if you are suffering from prosopagnosia then you have an inability to actually know who you're looking at so our sensory processes are going to really depend on two different things happening the first is transduction with this it's when you can for you are going to convert one form of energy into another one that your brain can actually use and then our brain is going to give us the process of psychophysics where basically we look at how the physical stimuli that are going to give us a sensation are going to be translated into a psychological experience for example if someone is playing the drums the drums are activating sound waves that our ears are going to detect and uh, this stimulation is going to give us sound however the psychophysics aspect of this is what's going to help us identify that's a drum set as opposed to maybe uh, a series of gunshots going off so a lot of the sensation is going to first depend on thresholds so if you have a stimulus uh, there could be a threshold for how potent it is if it's a smell how loud it could be if it's a noise uh, how strong of a taste it might be, how uh, intense it could be visually. So we actually have absolute thresholds, which are the minimum stimulus intensities that our sense can detect 50% of the time. So it could be that it is a, a faint candle light, candle light in the distance, uh, and there's a certain distance from which if it's pitch black, you should be able to detect it or not. There could be a, a faint smell, maybe it's a drop of perfume, in a four-room apartment, maybe it is a uh, the wings of a fly landing on your face from a distance of two centimeters, something like that. Um, a close cousin to the absolute threshold is going to be the difference threshold, also known in some textbooks as the just noticeable difference. And this is going to be the smallest difference in stimulus intensity that a sense can detect. Now let's say, for example, that you have a 100-pound weight and a 10-pound weight. And so if you lift up that 10 pound weight and then right beside of that there's an 11 pound weight, you're more likely to probably notice this difference. This is because that that one extra pound is actually more than 10 percent. It's an equi equivalent 10 percent of the initial 10 pounds. So you should be able to notice that difference. However, if you have a 100 pound weight and then beside of that there's a 101 pound weight, chances are you're not going to notice that difference because you're talking about a 1 percent difference. For weight specifically, usually there needs to be a difference of at least 2% or more. And so that 1% or the 1 plus 100 isn't really going to qualify for that. 
So even to this day, we pretty much still fall back on a law known as Weber or Fechner's Law. And basically, these are some early pioneers in looking at sensation and perception. And these guys are going to say that the stimulus intensity is really going to be how we detect it. And so to perceive a difference, two stimuli must differ by a constant minimum percentage instead of just a constant amount. So really, it's that percentage of intensity that's important. The more intense it is by a percentage, the greater likelihood we're going to also detect it. Another idea that looks at how exactly we're going to experience sensation and perception is something called the, sin, uh, the signal detection theory. And with signal detection theory, they're ultimately going to change out this idea of threshold being important as opposed to uh, saying that the human element of detectability is actually what's going to bring it home. So detection of the stimulus involves decision processes and sensory processes. So here there's no mention of anything such as threshold. So detectability is actually going to replace the threshold. So if you have the case of someone who is operating a radar, maybe for the Navy, and they're riding around, there's four possible uh, conditions that uh, can have a response. So you can have something that's there and it goes undetected. You can have something be detected, but it's not actually you know what you were looking for. You can have something that doesn't get detected at all, and then you can have something that you were looking for. It was detected, and then it was detected properly. That's what it was. So maybe in the case of like looking for uh, underground or underwater missiles, and you know you find something on a radar, they think it could be a missile, and ends up being a missile. That's a hit. If they have a false alarm, maybe they think something's a missile, but it was actually nothing. Maybe it was a, a whale. Or um, they're looking for missiles. However, uh, they fail to detect a missile. And so, you know, then their ship gets blown up. You know, that was a miss. And then you have the correct rejection where you could be looking for a missile. Something shows up. You think, um, this is similar to a missile, but it looks like a whale. And then it ended up being a whale, so they were correct. So those are your possible outcomes with the signal detection theory. We also have a type of perception which is uh, called a subliminal perception. So this is going to be perception without awareness. And generally, if something is not able to be detected 50% of the time or more, then it may be registering to our subconscious or maybe registering uh, without our conscious awareness. So if it is, this is called subliminal perception. Now, this has been tested a good bit. Uh, one maybe more recent case is when uh, there's a, a series of people who are going to watch a short clip focused on a bunch of different people. And within this, there's going to be a frame inserted that shows a bunch of kittens and a romantic couple, which is considered a positive scene. So overall, at the end, the people's end result evaluating all of the clip that they saw, they had a more positive experience saying that you know, ultimately they felt like the people they were viewing were, were more positive. So there was more smiles, uh, those types of things. However, when they tested this again and they had flashed a quick image of a dead body and a werewolf, which is now a negative scene, the people's interpretation of what they saw had a more negative effect. They thought that people were more uh, showing negative emotion. And so this is also called, in this case, priming when you're really trying to build someone up for a specific type of response, but you're doing it unconsciously. And so that's kind of like a classic case of what was going on. There's another case of subliminal messages here, just as some examples. A lot of the times they're paired up with things that are going to be for evaluative. So if you're going to try to pair up a celebrity with a specific phrase in a product, you can see in the middle here the rats, the Gore prescription plan. So the opposition to Al Gore when he was running for president tried to run a smear campaign against them, and they were going to subliminally put the, the frame rats across the clip to help people associate Al Gore with being a rat. The only problem is they actually left up this clip too long, and in doing this, everybody saw it. It wasn't subliminally registering. It was consciously registering. Uh, the other ones here, I'll just let you look at them, and you can try to find out on your own. It's part of the fun, I guess, with subliminal messages. Generally, I'll say they fall under the themes of uh, sexually explicit material, um, death, and then sometimes for product advertisements. The last point I want to go into before this is concluded is something called sensory adaptation. So sensory adaptation is when you experience the gradual decline in sensitivity to prolonged stimulation. So let's say you get home from school one day and somebody forgot to empty the trash and it just smells like last night's dinner but going bad. 
if you were to sit in that room and just expose yourself to the smell, after about 10 minutes, the intensity of that smell will have dropped by about 50%. So the smell is still the same, it's only that you've become more adapted to the smell. And so it's not as potent for you or it's not as intense for you. Another example might be if you are going to your neighborhood pool and let's just say it just opened for the summer and you're the first one that wants to swim and you jump in instantly that water feels freezing but most people know if you stay in the water long enough you eventually kind of get used to the water it doesn't get warmer it's just that your body's prolonged exposure to the water is actually causing you to experience sensory adaptation so you're getting more used to it so ultimately what this is going to do is allow your body to stay in tune with the changes that might occur rather than the uh, the constants of their sensory input and so your eyes are the only part of your body that will not experience sensory adaptation this is because your eyes react to so much stimuli they're actually constantly moving tiny little movements left and right and so everything else most likely you could probably come up with an example that will apply I would challenge you to do that but uh, that's going to pretty much conclude this lesson on basic sensation and perception. Hopefully you'll join me next time as we begin to look at some uh, components of the eye and perceptual processes. We'll look into the ear and other forms of sensation.